Hey everyone, this is part 5 of my 100 Bullets coverage. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down issues 31 through 36, the Counter Fifth Detective story arc. In this story arc, we're going to be following a character named Milo Garrett. He is one of Graves' minute man that had been put to sleep, and now he is working as a private investigator in Los Angeles. This story arc has all the classic crime noir PI tropes that you may have seen in several movies. Now, I will say, this volume is a little bit convoluted and overly complicated in the way that some crime noir tales can be too complicated. But still, the vibes are really cool and there are some really amazing moments in here, so it's still worth going through, although a little complicated, I must say. Alright, let's dive into it. Volume 5 of 100 Bullets. 100 Bullets, Volume 5, The Counter Fifth Detective. Written by Brian Azzarello, art by Eduardo Riso. This volume covers issues 31 through 36. 100 Bullets, Issue 31, The Counter Fifth Detective, Part 1 of 6. In this particular volume, we are following the Minuteman character, Milo Garrett. We actually very briefly first saw Milo in Issue 27, in the Idle Chatter story arc. In that issue, Agent Graves gave Milo an attaché case. However, the focus of that issue was dealing with the whole Joe DiMaggio, Agent Graves, JFK assassination thing, not really relating to Milo, but now we are following up on that Milo Garrett storyline. Milo Garrett, aka The Bastard, is a Minuteman. He has still not been woken up, however, and he has no memories of his Minuteman past. When he was deactivated as a Minuteman, he then assumed the life of a hard-boiled and heavy-drinking private detective in Los Angeles. He had his own office and cases. He was basically the stereotypical, pulp classic film noir PI character. Mila was recently hired by a man named Carl Reynolds. Carl is an art dealer. Carl wanted Milo's help in tracking down an art thief named Monroe Tannenbaum. When Milo figured out the location on this Monroe, he phoned Carl to tell him that he had some info. And then Milo got into his car and began driving over to Carl's office. On the way to Carl's office, though, Milo got into a car crash, and he almost died. He woke up in the hospital with his face horribly disfigured. That is when Agent Graves comes into the story, and informs Milo that Carl was the one responsible for his car crash. Graves in that hospital room tells Milo, What happened to you wasn't an accident. It was a message. Milo questioned, What does making my face look like dog food supposed to mean? Graves answered, The message wasn't even intended for you, sadly. You're just the messenger, and a mess of one now at that. But trust me, the message was received. I'm offering you the chance to get even with the garbage that trashed you. All the evidence you need is in the attaché. So are 100 bullets, all untraceable, as anonymous and unrecognizable as your face. You've got carte blanche. No law, no cops, no one federal can investigate. Use the gun and take out that garbage, and nothing will come back to you. Personally, you might even get a piece of yourself back. So Graves left Milo with the attaché case, and Milo spent some time in the hospital reading it over. After about two weeks, Milo was finally let out of the hospital, and he went to a bar. He pounded down three cocktails, and then he made a phone call. He phoned up Carl. Carl was the one responsible for his car crash. Carl also owes Milo some money for his investigative work into Monroe Tannenbaum, the art thief. So Milo phones up Carl, and Carl tells Milo to meet him at his office at 9 o'clock tonight. Milo says he will be there. Now, he still has a few hours to kill, so he drinks some more. He also gets into a bar fight with the drunk that accuses Milo of spilling his drink on him. Milo easily beats the man up. Later on, as Milo is heading over to Carl's office, he thinks to himself about the information in the attaché. The proof in the attaché was all there. It was pretty clear on the who, the when, and the how. 
But Milo, he didn't understand the why. He didn't see the motive. But he is hoping now he can get some answers. As Milo is walking up to Carl's office, he sees the psychopath Minuteman Lotto leaving Carl's office and walking down the hall. Milo does not recognize Lano because he does not have his memories from the past. And Lano does not recognize Milo because Milo currently has these bandages wrapping his face. The two of them walk by each other and even bump into one another, but they both keep going. When Milo finally enters Carl's office, he finds Carl dead, shot in the head, courtesy of Lano, who was just here. Milo is frustrated. This man Carl is the man that left him without a face, but now Milo does not understand the why. 100 Bullets, Issue 32, The Counter Fifth Detective, Part 2 of 6. Milo is frustrated. He planned on going to that office and killing Carl himself, but now that Carl was already dead, Milo just has more questions. Milo left Carl how he found him in his office. When he left, though, he took Carl's appointment book and the check that Carl had promised him. Milo, in search of answers, decided to go talk to this Monroe Tannebaum. Monroe Tannebaum was the art thief that Carl hired Milo to find. Milo heads to the strip club, Puss in Boots, to talk to Monroe. In the strip club, Milo sits beside Monroe. He flashes Monroe his gun. And then he calmly asks Monroe some questions. Milo asks, what does Monroe know about Carl Reynolds? Monroe plays dumb, says he never knew Carl. Milo finds that strange because Monroe double-crossed him. Monroe still plays dumb. Milo tells Monroe that Carl was found dead tonight with a hole in his head. Monroe starts getting a little nervous when he learns this information. He says, I didn't do it. Milo asks, well then who did? Monroe starts giving a little bit of information. He says that Carl, the art dealer, came to him to find some painting. The painting was called La Morte del César. It was an old painting from the 16th century. The painting was not for sale, though, but Carl needed it, so he hired Monroe to steal it. And when Monroe did successfully steal that painting, Monroe explains that a big scary guy came and offered him more money than Carl did for it. The big scary guy was in fact Lano, although Monroe did not know his name. Monroe says that the big scary guy was working for somebody else, he didn't strike me as a connoisseur of finer things. Monroe does share some information, though, that a company named Wilford Packing and Moving was sent to pick up the painting once this guy paid Monroe for it. So that is the next thread that Milo will chase down. He has to go talk to Wilford Packing and Moving and see if he can get any info. That will have to wait till the morning, though, as they will not be open right now. So, Milo instead goes to another bar named the Velvet Lounge. There he talks to a girl he's seeing named Nadine. He asks her when does her shift end. She says midnight. By 12.50, they're back at his place and they made love. Then they do it again at 2.15. Afterwards, Milo heads to a variety store to buy some cigarettes and whiskey. On the way to the variety store, Milo starts thinking about Lano, the guy he saw coming out of Carl's office. Milo figures that that is the guy that killed Carl, and he was also probably the guy that Monroe was talking about. Him killing Carl must have been a professional hit. Anyway, Milo buys what he needs at the variety store, and then afterwards he ends up getting into a fight with a man on the street outside of the store that looked at him kind of funny. After Milo beats that guy up, he continues walking home, and he starts thinking about what he's going to have to do tomorrow. 100 Bullets, Issue 33, The Counter Fifth Detective, Part 3 of 6. In the morning, Milo is still with Nadine at his place. He gets a visit by a cop named Chet Vargas. Chet Vargas is investigating the death of Carl Reynolds. 
Milo is a suspect because he recently cashed a check from Carl. Milo and Chet go for a walk and they talk. Milo explains why he was there. Carl hired him to do a trace. Milo demanded the money up front. When Milo went to collect his money, when he arrived, Carl was already dead. But his check was already written, so he took it. Milo knows he should have phoned 911, but he needed the money and things are tight right now and accidents ain't cheap. Milo then explains that he bumped into this brute going down the hall as he was headed up to it. This brute was big, dark hair, quiet guy, loud shirt. He smoked expensive cigars. Milo suspects that this was the guy that killed Carl. Chit asks, how do you know how much his cigars cost? Milo answers, I know what yours run, and his, well, they don't stink. Chet, skeptical, tells Milo, well, something about your story does. Milo, pointing to his bandaged face, replies, come on, Chet, is this the face of a man you can trust or what? Chet still remains skeptical, but he lets Milo go for now. As the day progresses, Milo eventually continues his investigations. He tries to chase down Wilford packing and moving. They were the company that Monroe Tannenbaum told him about that was going to ship the painting to its buyer. Milo phoned the company. He was talking to the receptionist. He lied and pretended he represented Steve Wynn of Wynn Casinos, the Wynn's own much of Las Vegas. Milo said that Steve, he wanted to get into the art game and they were looking for potential companies to work with. So Milo got connected to the president of the company. The president of the company assured Milo that they're the best, and any requirements that Mr. Wynn may have will surely be met. Milo then asked for some references, customers he could phone to check things out. Milo insisted the references had to be clients who had fine art shipped in the last month. So Wilford Packing and Moving gave Milo some names. Milo then cross-referenced those names with people in Carl Reynolds' address book. And sure enough, one of the names hit. It was Megan Dietrich, whom we know as one of the members of the trust. Megan hired Carl to get a painting for her. Carl couldn't get the painting legitimately, so he asked Monroe Tannenbaum to steal it for him. Well, Milo needs to speak to Megan and see if he can learn anything more. He goes to Megan's offices at Dietrich Securities, their uh, financial institution. Milo lies about who he is, giving a fake name, Mr. Lewis, and he pretends he's a big player and wants to invest millions of dollars. And that eventually scores him a meeting with Megan. Megan asks Milo out to lunch, and at lunch, she gives him a pitch. She says, Half your capital in 30-year government bonds would give you an annual income of $75,000. That's without ever touching the principal. The rest we put into blue chips, maybe keeping 5 million cash on the side? How's that sound? Milo says that sounds good, but he's thinking of investing in art. What does she think about that? Megan to this answers, I think that's a mistake. You should buy art because you like it. Milo questions, you don't like art? Megan answers, on the contrary, I love art and I have a wonderful collection. If you're interested, I can recommend some of the more prominent art dealers in town. Milo to this answers, oh, I've already hooked up with one. A real peach of a fella. Maybe you know him? Carl Reynolds? As soon as Megan hears that name, her eyes go wide. She replies, No, I'm afraid. I should really be getting back to the office. Once you receive your settlement, do call me, Mr. Lewis. Milo, thinking about Megan's reaction, thinks to himself, Megan was one beautiful piece of work, like most women. She had the unnerving ability to lie and tell the truth in the same breath. She knew Carl Reynolds, no question, and hearing his name scared her. He figured it would. Milo then goes back to his office and he tries to piece together what he knows so far. Megan Dietrich wanted to buy a painting. She contacted Carl Reynolds for it. Carl tracked down the location of the painting, but it wasn't up for grabs. So he went over to Monroe Tannenbaum, the art thief who stole it for him. Megan got wind of Carl's plan, so she sent a big and scary guy to make the deal with Monroe for her. That tough guy put the squeeze on Monroe and he choked up the painting which left Carl out flapping in the breeze. Carl was pissed that Megan went around him and was no longer willing to pay him. Milo does get a little confused though. Carl hired him to locate Monroe, and when Milo finally did locate Monroe, Carl tried to kill him, Milo himself. Milo, he's figured out A through X, but he's still stuck at the Y. 
As Milo's drinking and contemplating in his office, he gets a visit by a woman named Echo Memoria. Milo describes Echo as the knockout of all knockouts. We previously saw Echo briefly in issue 26, Mr. Branch and the Family Tree. She was supposedly a prostitute in Paris, and she was hooking up with Mr. Branch, seemingly learning about the Trust and the Minutemen from him. Echo asks Milo if he is available. Milo answers, Honey, I could be blessed with a pair of adorable kids, a white picket fence, a dog that brings me slippers with the paper, and a teenage nymphomaniac for wife. And for you, the answer would still be yes. Echo confused asks, Pardon? Milo answers, What could I do for you? Echo tells Milo she needs some help finding her lover. She explains that he disappeared a mere three days ago. Milo asks, Let me guess, at the airport? Echo asks, How do you know? Milo replies, Your accent. It's French, am I right? Echo answers, No, it's Italian. I didn't think I had one. Milo continues, It's a subtle accent. So, your boyfriend, you got a name, a picture? Echo pulls out a picture of Monroe Tenenbaum. She wants Milo's help to track him down. Milo took the case, and he neglected to mention to Echo that he actually met her Prince Charming the night before. Later on, Milo goes to the hotel where Monroe Tannenbaum is staying. Milo lockpicked his way into the room. The place seemed empty at the moment, so Milo sat down and waited for Monroe to return. As Milo was waiting, though, someone else came into the hotel room instead. It was Megan Dietrich. Megan, surprised to see Milo, asks, What are you doing here? Milo, holding a gun, replies, Miss Dietrich. How about you answer that question first? Megan answers, Mr. Tannenbaum asked me to meet him. Milo quips back, God damn, that Monroe's a regular playboy, huh? Megan replies, I wouldn't know, I've never met him. Milo asks, well then where'd you get his key from? Megan answers, I persuaded the man at the front desk. I was here to surprise Mr. Tannenbaum. Milo finds a gun on Megan and asks, is this the surprise? They talk for a bit. Eventually, Megan asks to use the bathroom. Milo tells her she can. When Megan goes into the bathroom, she lets out a loud scream. 100 Bullets, Issue 34, The Counter Fifth Detective, Part 4 of 6. Milo, hearing Megan scream in the bathroom, goes to check in on her. When he enters the bathroom, he finds Monroe Tannenbaum dead hanging in the bathtub, most likely murdered. Milo and Megan leave Monroe's place and they go to a diner to talk some more about what just happened. There, Megan finally tells Milo about Lano. She explains that Lano is cruel and vicious. At one point, he worked for her family. His job was to take care of what needed to be taken care of. Milo comments, must be comforting to be able to afford something like that. Megan answers, it's nerve-wracking, more like being a lion tamer, cracking a whip to have an animal jump through a hoop, when it could more easily turn and rip your head off. Megan continues, anyway, there came a point when the lion's services were no longer required. A week ago, I was in bed, and the phone rang at four in the morning. It was Lano, and he had something I wanted. The painting. Milo asks, how expensive was the hoop he made you jump through to get it? Megan answers, very, and the cost hasn't just been money. And after I took delivery of the painting, Carl Reynolds came by my office, and he threatened me, said he was prepared to go to the former owner with what he knew if I didn't give him the price we originally agreed upon. I laughed in his face. I'm not in the habit of paying for the same thing twice, Mr. Lewis. Once again, due to the bandages and Milo telling Megan a fake name, Megan does not know that... Mr. Lewis here is actually Milo Garrett, a Minuteman, and Milo, due to his lack of memory from his time as a Minuteman, does not remember Megan either. Megan continues, she says, That night that Carl confronted me, Lano called, and he said the joke was on me and that I would die laughing in his face. He also told me his new employer would be getting in touch with me. And earlier today, I received a telegram from Monroe Tannenbaum requesting me to meet him at his hotel room. The telegram said his agent had contacted me about his plans to set up a 
charitable organization in the name of Carl Reynolds and that I would be a very generous donor. Milo tells Megan that when Lano contacts her again to try to set up a meeting, she should give him a call. Megan asks, Mr. Lewis, why are you helping me? Milo answers, Maybe, baby, I just can't help myself. Later on, Milo goes to a bar and he drinks. In that bar, the Minuteman Cole Burns is there. He's having his signature drink of tequila with limes. Cole talks to Milo. He tells him that they both work for the same man, Agent Graves. Milo tells Cole, you're wrong, I'm in business for myself. Cole responds, yeah, now you are. Carl Reynolds is dead. Milo asks, so? Cole to this says, so? Graves is concerned, thinks you may be getting in deep over your head, thinks you might need a hand. Milo cuts Cole off and tells him, Tell him I'm getting to the bottom of this. Carl was just the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to handle this alone. Cole backs off and says, Suit yourself. Milo, a bit of advice. Keep your right up, or there'll be nothing left of you. Once Cole left, Milo drank some more, then he went to bed. He slept. In the morning, Megan phoned him and told him that Lano contacted her and wanted to meet. They were supposed to meet at a diner, so Milo went there to meet Lano in Megan's place. When Milo entered the diner, he saw Lano sitting at the counter, drinking coffee with a newspaper in hand. Milo sat at the opposite end of the counter, and he stared Lano down. The waitress came by. Milo asked for a coffee and then he continued watching Lano. Lano, he finished his coffee. And then he put down a $10 bill. Lano was preparing to leave. He actually stood up. But then Milo motioned to Lano from across the way. He showed Lano his gun, and then he pointed down, signifying for Lano to sit back down and stay. Lano, he then shot back a sadistic smile, and he sat back down. So now, the two of them are just silently communicating with each other from across the counter. Lano, he gets comfortable. He opens his shirt. He settles in. Milo's staring down Lano. Lano, he uses his finger, makes a little finger gun. He points to the guy right beside Milo. He signifies to Milo that if Milo doesn't back down, Lano's gonna kill this guy. Lano, he smiles sadistically. And then, three kids walk in, holding skateboards. Lano, he then takes his little finger gun, and he goes over to the kids and points at them, signifying he's gonna shoot them if Milo doesn't back down. Milo is thinking in his head, how is he gonna play this? Both of them are staring at each other. Milo's nursing that coffee. Both of their eyes are glued on each other. But then, all of a sudden, the waitress comes by to top off Milo's coffee. Her cleavage and stupid flare pins right in Milo's face. Milo pushes her aside, and when he moves her, he sees that Lano has left. Milo, he immediately gets up and chases after him. But when he gets outside, it is too late. Before I move on, I just want to comment on how great the storytelling was there in that diner. No words were spoken between Milo and Lano, but it was so intense. Their stares at each other and their motions. Great stuff. After Milo's botched attempt at talking to Lano, he gets frustrated. He goes home. He tries to give Megan a call, but she ignores it. So he goes to Megan's mansion to pay her a visit. When he arrives at Megan's home, Milo is stopped at the gate. He tells the guy at the gate to let him through or bring Megan to him. The security guy at the gate just tells Milo to leave. Milo, he threatens the guy. He says, look, you want to do this the hard way? The security guy, not willing to back down from a fight, opens the gate and he gets ready to beat the shit out of Milo, but Milo quickly takes him down. Milo goes to the house and lets himself in, and when he enters the house, there is a big party happening. Megan is entertaining lots of guests. Some of the attendees at this party are other members of the trust. When Megan's guests see Milo, they joke, he didn't tell us King Tut was going to be here. Milo goes over to Megan and asks her, why have you been avoiding me? Megan answers, I had more pressing matters to attend to. Milo, he then looks around the room and notices a huge painting. He asks, is that it? Megan answers, yes. 
me a little questions. Mind if I take a look? I mean, I never seen no picture worth dying for. Megan tells him, well, then you should look at it. Milo looks at the painting. It is from the 1600s. There's various people talking, dressed in the attire of the era. They are standing in front of a doorway, and above the doorway is the word Croatoa. Croatoa is the key word that wakes up a minute man. When Milo sees that word, he freaks out. Megan asks, Mr. Lewis, are you all right, Mr. Lewis? 100 Bullets, Issue 35, The Counter Fifth Detective, Part 5 of 6. Milo, as soon as he saw that painting in the word Croatoa, he booked it out of Megan's home into his car and he drove away. As he was driving, he was drinking champagne and he couldn't help thinking that. He was crazy. Here he is, running away from a painting, trying to forget a word. Milo, he's pounding alcohol and driving so erratically, it's almost like he is trying to forget his past. Trying to forget that word. While Milo is drinking and driving here, he swerves off of the road and crashes his car. When Milo crashes his car, he is in a ditch, and he is starting to remember glimpses of his past. He sees himself as a Minuteman with his other fellow Minutemen. They are all dressed in suits. They pull a man out of a trunk. He has a bag over his head, and they light the man on fire. Milo is then rocked out of this memory and back to the present day. Megan Dietrich finds Milo's crashed car. She goes down and wakes him up and pulls him out of the car. Megan is still referring to Milo as Mr. Lewis. Megan first asks if he's in any pain. Milo answers, yeah, I just bought this frickin' ride. Megan then asks, what happened back there? Milo answers, sorry, it's bad form showing up to a party already drunk. Megan quips, yes it is, it's also bad showing up uninvited. Megan says that we should get you to a hospital. Milo rejects this no, saying, no, 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 if we're going anywhere, it's home, my place, not yours. So the both of them head back to Milo's apartment. Milo takes a bath. Afterwards, he gets out and talks to Megan. The two talk, and Megan says she's scared. Milo asks Solano. Megan answers no, of you. Milo drops his towel, and the two of them embrace, and they eventually get it on. Milo fell asleep, and he woke up in the late afternoon. Megan had already left his place. Milo pops some pain pills, and then he heads outside. And when he is outside of his place, Agent Graves pulls up in a car. He offers Milo a ride. Milo decides to get in the car. After all, his is at the bottom of a ditch. Graves asks, how's the case? Milo answers, which one you mean? The one I'm working on or the one full of bullets you gave me? Funny how it turned out they're connected. Graves replies, they are? Well, I'll be damned. They are, so are we. Milo tells Graves, look, I'm going to crack my case, and sorry if that busts your balls. Graves asks, you like your line of work, don't you? Milo answers, it beats digging Graves. Graves then asks Milo, can I ask you a question? A few years ago, you were arrested. What for? Milo, he got arrested for getting in a fight. Graves continues, do you remember the fight? Milo tries to think back, but it's kind of hazy. Graves asks, Milo, do you remember anything before waking up in that jail cell? Milo thinks on it, and he can't seem to fully remember it all, although perhaps he is fighting against remembering, too. Eventually, Graves drops Milo off at his office. Milo heads inside, and inside his office is the detective, Chet Fargus. Chet is looking through Milo's files. Milo says, hey Chet, you got a warrant? Chet questions Milo about the death of Monroe Tenenbaum. The clerk at the hotel saw a guy with bandages leaving with some woman from that hotel. So tell me, Milo, why did the mummy strike? Chet, he is sort of in a way accusing Milo of murdering Monroe Tenenbaum. Milo, he's not going to answer Chet's questions. He tells him, you better get that warrant. Chet leaves and warns Milo, 
You better know what you're doing. As soon as Chet leaves, Milo gets a phone call. On the line is Echo Memoria. She is phoning to find out the status of her case. She hired Milo to find Monroe for her, after all. Well, Milo informs Echo that Monroe is now dead. She should probably start looking to find an Undertaker. Echo replies, An Undertaker? Tannenbaum was not my boyfriend. I don't care what's done to his body. I care about a painting. You've seen it? Milo replies, Yeah. Echo asks, Can I see you? Milo, he goes across town to meet Echo at the hotel she's staying at. Echo then starts being a little bit more forthcoming with the truth. She explains that she worked with Tannenbaum. He was the art thief, but she more so opened doors. She says that Tannenbaum was working with a partner. She did her business while Tannenbaum did his. Naturally, her business took longer. And Tannenbaum left her with the short end and without the money that he'd promised her. She still doesn't have that money, so she wants the painting. She wants Milo's help to get it. She says that she will make it worth his while. Milo replies, well, my while's worth a lot. Echo to this says, so am I. Milo replies, well, not dead you're not, and that's what Carl and Monroe and your accomplices are. Echo says she can take care of herself. All of a sudden, the two of them hear a knock at the hotel room door. Milo tells Echo to answer it. Echo does, and then she says, Carl, what a surprise. Milo thinks to himself, Carl, Carl's dead. Milo, hiding in the room, looks over and sees it is actually Lano. Lano grabs Echo and puts a gun to her head. Milo, he then points his gun at Lano. Lano starts moving closer to Milo. The two of them were in a little bit of a standoff. Lano was making Milo back up further and further into the room. And then eventually, Lano pushes Echo into Milo with such force that Milo and Echo fall through the window and down to the ground below. 100 Bullets, Issue 36, The Counter Fifth Detective, Part 6 of 6. So Milo and Echo fell out the window. It was only a two-story drop, but it hurt. Milo ended up having to go to the hospital. When Milo eventually leaves the hospital, Echo comes to greet him. She tells him that Milo cradled her, and she landed on top of him. Afterwards, she went back inside the hotel. Echo thanks Milo for saving her life. The two of them get into a taxi cab together. In that cab, Milo starts talking through his theories. He says, So Lana was with Monroe before he pulled the heist. Monroe lied to me. He told me that Lano didn't lean on him until after he had the painting. Echo asks, why did you believe him? Milo answers, well, generally, people have a problem lying to me. Echo replies, I didn't. Milo to this says, well, I got a problem with that too, but it's low on my list right now. Milo makes the cab driver take them to the airport. And once they arrive at the airport, Milo tells Echo, look, Echo, we got to get you out of here. You were part of a job that's taking an ugly turn, and you're in way over your pretty little head. So, if you don't want it cut off, you got to cut your losses. Meaning, yeah, got to get out of America. Echo, she pleads, but my money. Milo tells her, it ain't yours, capiche? You got beat out of it, and you better walk away, so fly. I'll see you next fall. After Milo left Echo at the airport, he drove back to his offices, and he gave Megan Dietrich a phone call. When he phones Megan, Megan is very cold to him. She tells Milo, I know who you are. Are you calling to gloat? My home was invaded, my men slaughtered, and my painting vanished. So it sounds like last night when Megan was with Milo, her place got robbed. Milo, he knows nothing about this though. He says, what? Megan tells Milo to drop the charade. Milo continues saying, I don't know what you're talking about. Megan says, look, when a man invites a woman to his place, given the first chance, she'll look around. She'll get a gauge of what kind of man she's with. It's all telling from his furniture to his hamper to his mail. I know who you are, Milo. And I know who your friends are. She then hangs up the phone. 
Megan has finally learned that Milo was one of the Minutemen. Milo still didn't fully remember his past, though. Milo thinks back to what Megan said, I know who you are. Hearing that seemed like a dirty little secret that everyone else was in on but him. Milo, he then went to the bathroom. He removed his bandages, and he looked at his face in the mirror, and he asked himself, Who are you? Later on, Milo goes to the bar where his girlfriend Nadine works. He talks to her for a bit, and then he borrows her car. He then drives across town over to Megan Dietrich's home. Megan is scared of Milo when she sees him. Milo tries to reassure Megan that he means her no harm. He tells her, I'm not a killer. I'm not. You don't have anything to worry about. Lano's done with you. Megan upset says, you two played me. Milo replies, true, but separate games. Forget about me and I'll forget about you, deal? And about the other night, Megan cuts him off and says, you brought me to that apartment to kill me. I used what I have to stay alive. Milo then returns to his offices. Out of frustration, he punches through the glass on the door that leads into his office. He breaks the glass, removing the part that reads, Milo Garrett, Investigation. He starts remembering more of his past, but he's trying to fight against it. He thinks to himself, Truth be told, I was going to have a hard time forgetting Megan Dietrich, especially in the shower, but forget her I would. And not just her, but Graves, Cole Burns, all of them and part of me. It had to be that way if I wanted to stay who I am. Who I am is Milo Garrett, a private eye. I live case to case. Once in a while, that's enough to pay the bills. I drink too much, tip too little, according to most anybody that pours for a living. I got a smart mouth and the stones to back it up. I kick ass and chase tail. I got acquaintances, not friends. I like who I am. I love being me. And me and my lost face, literally. Carl Reynolds, the art dealer I was working for, he was responsible and dead. And my old associate, Lotto, a hired howitzer, make that panzer tank, rolled over Carl before I got to rock him. That left me with a question I'd been trying to answer ever since I found Carl dead in his office. Who paid Lotto to put the hit on Carl? Whoever it was realized that Carl hired him to poke around for Monroe Tannenbaum. The whole job was set up so one hand wouldn't know what the other was doing. And when Milo started sticking his fingers where they didn't belong, Carl was strong-armed into cutting them off. The question is, though, by who? Milo, he then started flipping the pages in Carl's date book. He figures maybe there was a name, one that he overlooked before he knew what he was really looking for. Milo, he pours over that notebook for a while, and eventually, he finds that name. The person that hired Lano to kill Carl. When Milo discovers the name in that date book, he comments to himself, well, fuck me with a 10-foot pole. That is when Lano approaches Milo's office and replies, I got one, but I don't swing that way. Lano points his gun at Milo. Milo sits at his desk and pours himself a drink. Lano says he's gonna shoot Milo unless he gives him a reason not to. Milo replies, I could give you a hundred. Lano questions, you got a name, Invisible Man? Milo thinks on it and he answers with a lie. He says his name is Claude Rains. Claude Rains is the name of the actor that played the Invisible Man in the original 1930s movie. Lano, he answers, Okay, Clad, your number's up. Lano prepares to shoot Milo. Milo punches Lano in the face. Lano wipes the blood from his lip, and then he shoots Milo several times, and Milo goes down. Lano then starts beating Milo with the butt of his gun, and then he fires a few more bullets into him. What was the name in the date book of Carl's that Milo saw? The one that was responsible for hiring Lano to kill Carl. Well, we see, Lano, when he left Milo's office, he went to a car that was waiting for him downstairs. And when he gets in that car, who is inside? But Echo Memoria, waiting for Lano. It turns out, the two of them were working together for a while. The two of them then start 
making out. And then we see back in Milo's office over his dead body, we see that date book open, the date book of Carl's. And in that date book, we see Echo's name. All of this only becoming clear to Milo in his dying seconds. Lano and Echo are the ones that are now in possession of the painting. They stole it from Megan's home. And with this, we end Volume 5 of 100 Bullets. All right, so that was volume five. Let me go through my thoughts on this volume. I loved the artwork and the vibe of it, and I really felt they nailed the crime noir storytelling. I thought the scene in the diner with Milo and Lana was so good, how they're both communicating just through the artwork, no dialogue, and they're just staring at each other. And Milo's telling Lano to sit down, he's flashing his gun, and Lano sits down, and then he starts finger-gunning people, sort of threatening them if Milo doesn't back down. Great storytelling in that scene. And uh, yeah, there was lots of really cool moments in here. But overall, I was a little bit confused by the story and why everyone was doing everything and how it all came together in the end. In fact, let me try to break it all down again right now, okay? All right. Megan Dietrich hired this Carl guy to buy this painting for her. The painting could not be bought legitimately, so it had to be stolen. So Carl hired this Monroe guy to steal the painting. Monroe, he went over to Europe, and he stole the painting in Europe, working with Echo. I don't know what Echo was doing, maybe distracting people or whatnot. And also, he was maybe potentially working with Lano too, I'm not so sure. But Monroe, he got the painting and he left Europe without them, kind of screwing them over. Monroe then gave the painting to Megan. And Carl, he hired Milo Garrett to find the location of Monroe because Monroe was kind of going around him and not uh, looping him in. So Milo found the location of Monroe, but then Carl tried to kill Milo for some reason in a car crash to perhaps cover something up, but Milo didn't die, so he went to go see Carl later. And then Lano, working with Echo the whole time, killed Carl and later killed Monroe and later on stole the painting from Megan. And that is what I think happened. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm still a little confused by everything and uh, what it all means. But honestly, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. It does not matter. Uh, in the end, what's important is that Milo is dead and Lano killed him. And uh, that's basically all we need to know here. And there was this painting out there and uh, Echo really loves this painting and wants it for whatever reason. <laughs> so yeah, cool volume. Although because of the overly convoluted plot, I'm going to give this volume a 7.5 out of 10. Uh, you know, not my favorite because of those uh, aspects in it, but still really cool artwork and really cool vibes. Let me know your thoughts in the comments on this one, and I will see you all in the future with 100 Bullets Volume 6.